Welcome to Data Basic. We discuss the key issues in the field of data science, supported by the Warwick Data Science Society. I'm Yoko Weber Smith, a third year more student, and in this episode, having a discussion with Dr. Jane Hutton, a professor at the University of Warwick, as well as being chair of the Statistics and the Law section of the Royal Statistical Society. The theme of this episode is asking the right questions, all about how misguided statistics can lead to confidence in questionable decisions. We'll also have a segment with Tim Hargreaves, the president of Work Data Science Society, about how to deal with missing values in data. Could you give us an overview of what you mean by what is the right question and how it relates to the work that you do? So I started as a, an academic statistician at Liverpool, where part of my role was to act as a consultant for medical doctors who would come uh, talk to us about their research. And sometimes you would get somebody coming along saying, I've done all this data collection, can you analyze it? And you'd say, what question are you asking? And they'd say, oh, I wanted to look at the causes of this particular complication. So I've collected lots of people with this complication. And you'd have to say, but how do they differ from people without the complication? You haven't collected anything about that. So very often people would have, you know, they might have quite a good intuition of the kinds of problems there would be, but you would need to refine it into a well-defined question before you could do anything useful. So you might have a question that sounds perfectly sensible, you know, what's normal blood cholesterol level or, or normal weight? But the point is, is that really what you want to know? And what do you mean by normal? Because as I discovered then, what's regarded as a normal cholesterol level in China, where they eat very little dairy, is very different from what's regarded as a normal level in the UK. And if you want to ask what the normal weight is in the UK, well, the normal weight is to be overweight because you then start thinking, well, actually, that's not really the question you're asking. The question you're asking is, what are the consequences of having a blood cholesterol level like this or weight like that quite often in the long term? And what are the consequences of lowering it? So there were experiments to lower blood cholesterol levels. And one of the results of one of those trials was actually that far more people on the cholesterol lowering drug committed suicide. So my job is very much about what questions are you asking? Can we see what do we already know about it? Can we refine it? And can we just occasionally think about the bigger picture? Because obviously we need focus, but occasionally we need a bigger picture. So if you focus on how do we depre- prevent deaths from COVID-19 and you do what the WHO did initially and said everybody locked down throughout the world, Well, you might prevent deaths from COVID, but you're going to have an awful lot of deaths in Africa from sheer starvation. You know, people in Mozambique were prevented from going to their own fields to get any food. So as well as asking what is the right question to get a precise question, say, for research, it's also always useful to say, and what is the wider picture of that? You're wanting to do this research. What do you really want to find out? And will this help you do that? Well, I mean, that's clearly a very serious, um, you know, topic because, uh, for example, with the with the blood cholesterol drug, if the people committed suicide, um, in a sort of in a from a from a purely scientific point, you've lost this data in a way, and for, obviously from a human point, that's a terrible thing to have happen uh, during a trial. So, uh, do you have any examples? Um, yeah, oh, I mean, I guess the second question is just: Do you have any specific examples? Uh, where the right questions weren't being asked and and people sort of they thought they knew what they wanted to know but actually they it either wasn't as clear to them or or they they were looking for the wrong thing without realizing it so one of the um well in a way quite amusing examples goes back um 25 years or, or more there was a a professor from a London medical school who'd been on a trip to the US and had discovered algorithms and programming and he thought, ah, well, what I'll do is I'll record a whole lot of interviews of prospective medical students, and then we'll get the algorithm to implement that, and then we'll have a fair way of assigning places at medical school. 
And so this was used for a few years until a young man called, let's say, Suki Singh um, applied to medical school and was rejected. So he put in another UCAS application, but this time as, say, John Smith. That was the only difference, the name. And that time he got offered a place. In fact, the medical school, when this was pointed out to them, they took themselves to the um, Equal Rights Commission. They admitted they'd got it wrong. What they had done was assumed, if we have a set of rules that are followed, they will be fair. Well, in fact, the set of rules followed the prejudices of the time. And therefore, you know, copying an existent consensus doesn't necessarily mean things are fair by the other criteria. So yes, it's important to know what people are thinking, but one should always be careful when you get the, but everybody thinks line. Um, that quite often means we'd really rather not know about the data and the quality of the data. Um, it doesn't mean that what everybody thinks is wrong, but uh, allowing a consensus to dominate. I mean, the classic example of that was in, in Vienna when a young doctor pointed out that the reason women were dying in childbirth were people were coming from the dissecting rooms straight to uh, attending women and not washing their hands. So I think if, you, if you're wondering about the fairness of a question, um, we've heard a lot about algorithms recently. And some of that has been, you know, it's, is the stop and search policy fair? Well, it's really important you ask the right question then. And you, you say what you want to achieve because there are different things you could achieve. So if your question is, are equal proportions of men and women stopped and searched because they're roughly equal proportions of men and women in the population? That's one question. Is that the right question? Another question is, of the men and women who are stopped, are equal proportions found to be carrying knives or drugs or so on? So if you were stopping equal proportions of men and women, then from what I know, you'd probably find one in a hundred women carrying a knife and 10 in 100 men carrying a knife, say. So you might be fair in the numbers you're stopping as an absolute proportion of the population, but that's not necessarily fair if you're saying what we want to try to achieve is that at least half the people we stop are actually carrying a knife. Then you would have to have very different proportions of men and women. And so the point is, if you, you very often can't be, if you like, fair, um, across a very wide range of things. Um, this came up in a big medical, um, well, consumer protection case about metal on metal hip replacements, where there were things saying, these replacements aren't as long lasting as long as we would expect. But of course, if those replacements are put into young active people to allow them to continue sport, and you compare them with a different kind, which are given to people in their 80s to allow them to move around their house and maybe get to the bus stop, is that a fair comparison? So this really has very substantial um, ramifications everywhere. And whenever somebody says that's not fair, I automatically think, can we make that question a bit more precise? What is it that we really want to achieve? Right, fantastic. Yeah, it's uh, really important to know what you're going for and know if there is bias or if there is some uncertainty, we understand, does it come from us and our preconceptions of, of, of how things should be and is this affecting our model? Or is it actually genuinely variance in the data that we need to explain somehow through the model and it's not just us putting it there? Yeah, yeah. there was actually a nice, well, I think it's a nice example. When I was on the Warwick University Quality and Diversity Committee and we were looking at the progress from applying for a job to getting shortlisted for an interview to getting the job. And there were two groups of staff where things didn't look really quite right in terms of ethnicity. Um, one was in one of the manual worker categories, one was in research uh, fellows. And so I said, right, so this is what we need to look at in a lot more detail. And what was interesting was that what came out of that was that the two groups were quite different. For the research fellows, um, people were being excluded because they didn't meet the job specification. You must have a PhD in mathematics or something. So in fact, although 
disproportionately more people from, I think, the Indian subcontinent were not getting through to shortlisting, there was a very good reason for that. They, they simply didn't meet the job specification. In the manual workers, they found they were quite concerned and they put in place things like uh, making sure the advertisements went into local newsletters in different local languages and so on. The, the catchment group is very different in order to change, um, to address a sort of a lack of people coming in and even applying. So yes, you know, the, the similar looking things can turn out to have very different explanations. Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic example of, of looking deeper into the data and then seeing why things are the way they are. Um, so what is the or what is a common statistical or probability error that you see being made, um, particularly in academia? So within academia, um, I think one of the things that, that I see most of and I, I would most like to be able to correct uh, is having not defined a question properly is not designing the right data collection and assessment. And so people simply go and get the wrong information. The worst is when you, you see a PhD student who spent three years and simply, you know, because the whole subdiscipline doesn't understand the issue, has not corrected what they actually need. Uh, so, you know, a student saying, but I've collected tens of thousands of samples well, you've looked at tens of thousands of cells, but they only came from three rats. And it's still three rats. Um, so that, that's really very sad. There's always this danger of it's something's difficult to measure, so we'll try and measure something else. Or it's expensive, um, so we'll, we'll just try to do something else. And in general, you're much, much better off collecting a little bit of good data than getting a lot of bad data. You can have a sample size of, I think about 23 million, um, which you need that size of, of data pulled off the internet or something to be the equivalent of a proper random sample of size 100. So the, the biases can be very, very big. The other very common mistake, um, I suppose this is more social sciences than, than it is science. Very common mistake is to think, well, I'm going to talk to this people, these people, so I'm going to ask them hundreds of questions. And you repeatedly say, you've got a trade-off. If you're going to send a questionnaire to, say, a 1,000 people, you can send a questionnaire to a 1,000 people with, you know, the background basic information, you know, male, female, age group, region of the country, say, and then the five questions you really want to know the answer to. Or you can send a questionnaire to a thousand people and you think, oh, I'm sending these questionnaires out, I'll send them 300 questions. Now, the trouble is, the second case, you send out your 300 questions and of the thousand, maybe a hundred or so people bother to reply. Whereas if you send out 10 questions, you're probably going to get a much higher response rate, 500, 600 or something like that. But I find people would much have rather have this obviously very, very biased data than smaller data sets. And it's certainly one of the issues with, you know, for example, with COVID, where I've been involved in some of the hospital data, I think they're simply trying to collect too much. You know, if people are in an emergency situation trying to save people's lives, you don't want them to have to spend hours filling in forms because they've got no motivation to it. So a lot of the data, you there'll be a question like, you know, was this person overweight? You know, the obesity that we've heard of in the press. Well, the data is missing for half of the people. And even when it isn't missing, quite often it's marked as unknown or something else. The ethnicity data, there's a big group of white, about 50%. Then there's about 12% of people of other. There's about 12% of people marked unknown. And then the next largest group is about 5% of people who are in the category of other Asian or something. There's no point in asking people to collect data if they, if they don't have the time. And you should pick that up very quickly in something like COVID. And you stop collecting what you don't absolutely need because it's much better to get accurate data on what you do need. Um, for anybody who's really interested, if you go to the Royal Statistical Society webpage and go under 
news and events, you'll find a number of reports about COVID and the quality of statistics. Also, of course, we, we saw a debate about algorithms with A-levels this summer, and the Royal Statistical Society has made some comments on that as well, where you can use an algorithm usefully and where you might not be able to. Okay, I mean, just as a as a second example that's, that hits rather closer to home for um, a few professors, uh, module evaluation formats, oh sorry, module evaluation forms, uh, trying to make them as short as possible so we actually get responses uh, so that they can actually see whether people like the module or not. Uh, yes, I, I've had um, some of my young colleagues on staff student liaison committees have, have occasionally done my preferred approach. Um, but it's, it's a very nice example of one of the points of it's difficult to measure something uh, that we really want to. So let's just measure process. Let's have a tick box form because that's easy. If you really want to know about your teaching, um, you just say, list up to three things that are, you thought were good about this course and that you think I shouldn't change and give me up to three suggestions for improvement. The reason that's important is that if you give people tick boxes, they will typically tick the boxes and they will never check everything's fine. But if you do the open format, so some years ago, I had this open format. I was teaching statistics to medical students. I can assure you it's not their favorite subject. But the only suggestions for improvement I was getting were things like, can it please not be nine o'clock on a Monday morning? Could there please be enough chairs and tables? Now, of course, the implicit feedback is we're happy with this course. You know, they told me positive things, but they had no substantial negative criticisms. But the same group of students given a tick box for would not have ticked everything as perfect. Um, but it's the, the trouble with that is it takes a bit more effort to process the forms and it doesn't fit very neatly into boxes. On one occasion in Newcastle where the students had to fill in a lot of forms, I asked one group of students I was teaching, I was saying, I think if I give you the form next week, it'll be your 12th form this term. So I'm gonna turn my back on you and say, how many of you want to complete the form and how many of you would rather just tell me what I need to change and can somebody please vote you know count the vote okay who votes in favor who votes against and then I turned around what was the vote they didn't want to complete the form but when I went into the next lecture there was a bunch of flowers and a box of chocolates now that doesn't fit onto a module feedback form and and that's the difficulty as with as a statistician we don't always want to collect more data and we don't always necessarily want easy data. When people say, oh, but you know, it's difficult to measure, we've got to do something else. It's very effective to just kick them on the shin and then say, how do you measure pain? <laughs> and because we can't measure pain, let's just, you know, take a tape measure and find out how tall you are. You know, it's this balance between what is important and what is easy. Yeah, I mean, if... For example, when you were saying about tick boxes and, and wanting easy data, obviously it's very easy to say, do you like the course? Yes, no. Um, do you think we can improve this? Yes, no. Even even if if you can ensure that people answer it, which, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, all the SSLC and their lovely emails, like, please fill out this form. We would appreciate it. Um, but I think even if you get maybe half the replies, if it's qualitative, specific things to improve, I feel like that's somewhat more useful because if someone has genuinely thought I would like to bring this up rather than this is already here, I'll answer because it's there, even though I have no strong opinion on it either way. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, just a comment. And, and you also make it clear to students that a non-response will, will be interpreted as I have nothing important enough to say. Joining me now is Tim Hargreaves, the president of Warwick Data Science Society, and we're going to be having a discussion about missing values, what they are, what types there are, and how we can deal with them. Thank you, Martin. Great to be here. So this is a conversation that's really been a long time coming. It's one that I'm really looking forward to talking about, because missing values and how we go about dealing with them is such an important topic, not just for data scientists, but for anyone that works with data in their daily work. Now, despite this, the sort of data we're exposed to at university is often cleaned up and pre-prepared so we don't have to deal with missing values. And this doesn't give a very reflective view of what data looks like in the real world. 
And so it's very important to have this discussion and learn a bit more about how we can deal with that so we're ready to tackle some real life examples. Yeah, so obviously dealing with missing values is important for all domains, uh, but two that really spring to my mind uh, would be in chemistry, in chemical fields, and in algorithmic trading. So for the first, you're often working with really small data sets. So losing even only a few values can actually be rather large proportionally to the size of your data set. And secondly, in algorithmic trading, you're looking for any edge you can get. So even a small one, like dealing with uh, missing values in the best way possible, can make a massive difference. So before we get into our conversation, it's worth mentioning that when we say missing data or missing values, actually there are many different types of missing data we could be talking about. Not all missing data is created equally. And so we're going to start by discussing these different types and when they might occur through some examples. And then we'll talk about how exactly we can deal with these missing values in different scenarios. But before we get to that, we need to ask exactly what is missing data? So missing data doesn't have a very surprising definition. It's just missing information. The important part is how this information is actually missing. You could just have some NA values, which is where you'd have some symbol to represent uh, a missing value just appearing in your data set, or you could have entire rows that are missing. Uh, for example, if your experiment had someone coming in for a medical checkup every year and you'd measure things like their height and their weight, if they didn't come in in one year, you would, um, you, that just wouldn't be a row in your data set. And so that's a much more subtle example of missing data because there's no clear missing value and a symbol to represent that. You have to know the design of the experiment, knowing that they're meant to come in every year to be able to spot that there's some data that's not there. Right, and one more example of missing values is where you have a value, but it's not the correct value. So in essence, the true value is still missing and you might not even realize. So before you start working on dealing with missing values, you have to really understand what is missing and it may not always be a very obvious thing. So once we know what data is missing, the next question is to ask, why is that data missing? And as mentioned earlier, there are many different types of missing data. And often the lines between these can be a bit blurred. It's hard to define exactly what type of missing data you have, but this is a general framework that's quite good in most scenarios. Now it's important to know why your data is missing because it will determine what is the best way to handle those missing values. And that can have a big impact on your analysis in the long run. So to introduce these different types of missing values, we're going to use an example. That's going to be based around weighing different animals at a zoo. So we'll have different animals from different species and different sexes, and we're going to be weighing them to determine how heavy they are. So the simplest type of missing data is known as missing completely at random. And it's where your data is missing due to some random process, but this process is completely independent of um, parameters that you're, that you're interested in, either whether they're observed or unobserved. So what might an example of that look like? So let's say you've got a set of electronic scales and every now and again they just malfunction. Uh, just completely random and you have no idea why and it's nothing to do with sort of the weight of the animal or what type of animal is being measured. So the key idea here is that because the data is going missing completely at random, knowing that some data is missing gives us no extra insight. On the other hand, missing completely at random data doesn't introduce any bias into our measurements. So because these missing values are completely at random in a certain column, the whole distribution of that column is unaffected by those missing values. Which means it won't affect statistics like the mean and the variance of that column. And for that reason, missing completely at random data is very easy to handle. But unfortunately, it's rarely the case that this sort of data comes up in real life. So a different type of missing value is called missing not at random. And it's where the value of the variable is actually the thing that's causing it to be missing. Um, so for example, if you're trying to weigh an elephant on some scales designed for small animals, then it won't be able to tell you the true weight of this elephant because it's outside of the, the, the range of these scales. And so you can see here that the weight of the animal is causing the value to be missing. So that is a very clear cut example known as truncation, where our data returns missing values when out of a certain operating range but missing not at random data can often be a lot more subtle. For example, if we tried to conduct a survey of people with depression, it may be the case that people with the most severe depression are the least likely to respond to that survey in the first place. 
Here there's no deterministic process that will mean anyone above a certain depression threshold will have missing values, but more the likelihood of them not responding increases as they become more depressed. So in this case, there is still some randomness. The key idea of missing not at random is that the randomness entirely depends on the underlying true value. Now, whereas with missing completely at random data, where we introduced no bias, it's almost certainly the case that missing not at random data will introduce some bias. For example, with the example when we were weighing elephants, by truncating our data at a certain threshold, it's going to lower the mean of the weights in that column, so it's not going to reflect the true mean that we would have had without the truncation. This introduction of bias can often mean that missing not at random data can be the most problematic for our analyses. That said, if we can understand what the source of this, um, these missing values are, then we may be able to correct them. And this is something that we don't have for missing completely at random data when there is no information contained in the fact that those values are missing. And finally, let's talk about missing at random, which is sort of somewhere in between missing completely at random and missing not at random. And this is where something is missing and it's missing because of a random process, but this random process is now dependent on the other values in the data set. So if we go back to our animal weighing example, we may notice that there are more missing values for male deer, and this could be because male deer tend to be more aggressive. And this actually has nothing to do with their weight, it's to do with something else that we've actually measured, their sex. And this is where the lines between these different types of missing values can start to become a bit blurred. It may be the case that missing at random data is dependent on the underlying value. For example, it could be the combination of a deer being male and large that makes it difficult for it to be weighed. This is still considered missing at random data because the fact that the data is missing is dependent on other variables than the one we're specifically looking at. It's only missing not at random data when the fact that the data is missing is dependent entirely on the underlying value of that one variable we're looking at. Unfortunately, there are no statistical tests to check whether data is in fact missing at random. Instead, we have to use a logical or systematic argument to determine whether it's likely to be the case. For example, knowing that male deer tend to be more aggressive and so hard to weigh would be such an argument. Whereas with missing completely at random data, where we don't introduce any bias, or with missing not at random data, where we're guaranteed to introduce bias, missing at random data may or may not introduce bias, depending on how we correct for it in our analysis. Right, so now that we know what the different types of missing data are, what are the techniques that we have to deal with it? Well, just like how there are multiple different types of missing values, there are also different ways that we can handle missing values. The simplest approach is called omission, and this is where we take rows that contain missing values and simply remove them. Now, there are two main risks associated with this approach. The first is that if your data has a lot of rows with missing values, you might substantially reduce your sample size and in doing so lose any sort of predictive power you had from your data. A slightly more subtle issue you might run into is when the subpopulation created by removing these observations with missing values is not representative of the initial population that you had. Now if our data was missing completely at random, this would never be an issue because the missing values are just completely random. But with missing not at random data, it may be the case that certain regions of our population have more missing values, and therefore, by removing those observations, we end up biasing our population. Another approach is called imputation, which is where instead of completely ignoring the missing values and removing them from our data, we try and find a reasonable guess for what they actually could be. A common technique here is to find the mean or the median of all the values that are there in a certain column, and using this value to put in where you don't have any values. Or we could go even further and take subsets of the data, say male and female species in our animal example, and do either mean or median imputation on those subsets. One problem with this technique, however, is that by adding extra values, you're essentially changing the distribution of the population. For example, even when your data is missing completely at random, if you substitute all the missing values with the mean, you've now skewed the distribution heavily towards the mean, so what you've done is you've reduced the variance. And if, for example, we have some truncated data, as in with the elephant on the scales, then the replacement for the missing value won't really make sense if you pick the mean, because the whole reason that they're missing is because they're too heavy, 
and therefore they're outside of the range of the non-missing data. One final common approach for dealing with missing values is called analysis. And this is where we use a model to try and predict what the missing values are from the other non-missing values in an observation. These models could be anywhere from a simple linear regression model all the way up to complicated Bayesian techniques and random forests. But that is an entire discussion by itself. So, um, feeding on from what we've uh, spoken before about errors you've seen, you've, sorry, you've seen happen in academia, uh, what are some common ways that you can, this is not a tutorial, but what are some common ways that you've seen people mislead uh, using statistics? I think there are two things that would come to mind. So I'll start with one of them, which is how do you compare things? Um, I think it's Michael Blastland who used the, the equivalent question, how big is that? So if you look at something like the oral contraceptive pill and you look at side effects, you can, and before you were born, I think, Martin, um, there was a headline saying oral contraceptive pill of this generation doubles your risk of deep vein thrombosis. And so huge panic and change and whatever. Now, in actual fact, what, what the study had found was that the underlying risk of deep vein thrombosis in women of childbearing age was one in 10,000 women. And if you took a population of women who were taking whatever third generation oral contraceptive pills, the risk was about two in 10,000. Um, and if you said to somebody, well, you know, there are benefits and disadvantages of using this oral contraceptive. Um, one of the risks is the risk of two in 10,000 per year of having a deep bone thrombosis then people can make up their mind what they think of it. Um, but if you say double, people get tend to get really worried. So um, David Spiegelholt, a professor of risk, has done a lot of work on communicating risks through the Went Winton Center. Um, I became possibly slightly notorious because um, in terms of effective modeling, uh, for a lot of data about risks, um, you model on a log odds scale. And you wouldn't necessarily, necessarily. In fact, typically, I would never present those results for a general audience on that scale. I would translate them back to the kind of one in 10,000 goes up to two in 10,000. Um, but there was a proposal to come up with something called number needed to treat. Uh, and it would say, we need to treat um, 33 people with that low dose aspirin to prevent one heart attack. And there were quite a number of problems with this, particularly the uncertainty that's presented. That's another common error, don't present uncertainty. Um, but the, one of the main points was that if you're comparing two rates, it's really a very bad idea only to mention one number. You know, I know people like to simplify things, but doubling just doesn't convey enough information. You always need the baseline risk. In fact, the Royal Society put out advice to that effect again 25, 30 years ago. So that's a common, common thing, not making it clear enough what your comparison is. The other very common one is the transposed conditional or the prosecutor's fallacy, so on. That's the, the classic one we'll be seeing at the moment, which is if you take a test for something related to COVID, and by the way, there is no proper quality control of tests. Um, and the test result is positive. You could ask the question, given that the test is positive, how likely is it that you've got COVID? Okay. Now, that's not the same question as if somebody has got COVID, how likely is it that the test will be positive? Because what happens is you're measuring some kind of continuum of reaction and you put down an arbitrary marker because you've got to cut off somewhere. Let's, let's go back to um, <clears throat> something like blood cholesterol. You take a blood sample and you've done enough study and you think if the, the sample's above a number like seven, people will really would benefit from treatment to prevent um, heart attacks below seven, they wouldn't. But there will be some people with a number above seven 
who are actually fine and some people with a number below, particularly even if you try to standardize, standardize by saying, you know, you mustn't have eaten anything for 12 hours and so on, there will be a difference if, over a longer period. So you select your test as a trade-off. If I put my figure at seven, um, seven is an arbitrary number. Don't anybody take this as anything other than an example. But if you take your number of seven, you say, okay, I'm going to do this test for COVID. Anybody who's a result above seven, I'm going to define as COVID. Any below body, not. You should have been testing that on a large enough group of people who you know from other reasons do and don't have COVID. So you can say, if I use this level, then of the people who have COVID, 95% will be test positive. And of the people who don't have COVID, 90% will be test negative. But once you roll that test out into the population, you can't say because COVID positive means a probability of 95% of being test positive. Test positive does not have a 95% chance of being COVID positive. And that is the most common mistake. It's made routinely by everywhere, probably including statisticians and they're not concentrating, that if you swap a question around, the answer can be very different. So with COVID, if the prevalence of COVID in your population is, say, 100 in 100,000, and you mentally test the 100,000 people, well, of the 100 people, 95 will have a positive test under the situation I've described. But of the remaining almost 100,000 people, let's just keep the round numbers, 90% of them will have a negative test. They're disease negative, 90% will have a negative test. But hold on a minute. That means 10% will have a positive test. And that means 10,000 positive tests and 95 from the negatives and 95 positive tests from the positives. So actually, your chance of being positive for COVID, given you've got a positive test, is very still very small. And Again, there's plenty of debate on the internet about that. And again, I would recommend, recommend Royal Statistical Society or the Winton Centre for the Public Understanding of Risk. And th that's a very, very common mistake that um, we forget which way around we're looking at a question. Are we looking at a question that says, given I can hear this voice, is that a woman? Or given this is a woman, do expect the voice to be of this pitch. Those, those are not really quite the same. They're not the same. And it's very easy to, to confuse the two. Yeah, I, I've, I've uh, had a discussion with uh, Tim, who's the, obviously the, uh, the president of, of Work Data Science Society, and he personally really doesn't like um, the, not only the words sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, he thinks they're you get them muddled up all the time but also when tests are presented um to evaluate a test perhaps it's it's useful to use sensitivity and specificity but to give this result to a human being and say oh we think you have covid and the chance sorry and the specificity or sensitivity of this test is 99 percent. that's almost that's a useless almost dishonest yeah like it, what it should say is something more like we've given you this test um, given that you have a positive reading, this is the chance that you actually have it. Um, and so, I, Martin, yeah. you, might, uh, you might find this a bit strange, but men can get breast cancer, and I had a colleague who did. But you're absolutely right. And one of the things that David Spiegelhalter worked hard on was the leaflets for women who asked to attend for screening for breast cancer. Because it used to be that you simply got the positive. If you... I'm sure you can get it on the internet. Um, if you look up, the, and I haven't looked at it for other diseases, but if you look up the, the information now for breast cancer screening, it actually acknowledges now that kind of point. It actually says, of the women who have a positive test and who need further investigations, this number will be found at further investigation not, not to have cancer. The other, other area where that's... Um, important but tends not to be made explicit is of course in screening antenatal screening 
tests aren't perfect, but, uh, you know, nobody likes to admit, oh, by the way, the baby of yours who just aborted for Down syndrome didn't have Downs. But that's happened to people I know and to doctors I know have, have come across that. Gosh, yeah. It, it's to, to just look at the high level for a second. It's so easy when talking about statistics to talk about the numbers. But when you really apply the statistics, I mean, yeah, when you apply the statistics to medical cases, you really are dealing with life and death. Or, for example, when it comes to cancer screening, if you tell someone that they have cancer, they can change their whole outlook on life just because of that one thing. Um, and often, I, I, I've, I've heard that, um, well, for, for example, if you have a cancer that won't actually affect your, your life because perhaps you, you die before it even, uh, before you even have the symptoms, knowing that you have it, again, can change the way you, you, you live your life. And the, these, these, ob these metrics of sensitivity and specificity, they, they don't capture, you know, they, they really don't capture. So I agree. I think, if you like, it's actually similar to that point I was making about whether you just talk double the risks, odds ratios, relative risks, and so on. Sensitivity and specificity are essential at the point at which you are deciding the value of the test. Um, and, and as I say, um, I imagine you could get an interesting consumer protection case on this, but actually diagnostic tests are not as far as I know regulated as part of the medicines side of things. RSS just to propose they should be. Um, it's always the same thing. What you may need for scientific skills. I don't want, if I've got a brain tumor, I don't want the, the, the surgeon messing around with a knife and fork because I can understand a knife and fork. I want him to do something serious with all sorts of interesting Latin names for bits of my brain. But I quite appreciate it if he can explain to me what I need to know in language I can understand. And I think sometimes that's not the same person and that's fair enough. I need my pure maths colleagues to do all the, and computing colleagues to do all the, all the, really important work that they do, which is enables me to do what I do. Some of them are not the best people to go out and give a public lecture. Fine. We don't all have to be able to do anything. But I think this is something the mathematicians are, I don't know about computer scientists, are perhaps less aware of than statisticians. We don't have to do everything, but it's quite a good idea if we collectively have people who can do the public understanding talk to the lay people as well as talk to the more technical people and be part of the chain of communication. And as I say, that that's what the Winton Centre for the Public Understanding of Science has done for a lot of things. It's tried to do find the best ways of doing that translation so that if somebody's having a cancer test, they can get information. And of course, with the internet, it's, it's easier and easier to give people information at a high level. And then if they want more information, they can go to the next degree of accuracy. Mm. Uh, yeah yeah i mean that would be that would certainly be uh, especially with your last comment on the about the internet um there's there's a danger to that there's a danger that way where, where you say okay oh i mean obviously um out front if you get a if you get a result that says okay you have this this and this mm -hmm. with this much accuracy mm -hmm. it's still there's there's this danger because um humans especially non-statisticians even statisticians aren't very good at, at low probability, high. Oh, but risk that's precisely things. that's precisely what what um, David Spiegel has done so much work on. He's come up with this idea of a micromort, which is a fraction of death, and so he it, it's a way of saying if you want to compare riding a bicycle with eating a bacon sandwich, with smoking cigarettes, can we in some sense get a scale for how much damage it's doing to your health? Um, I mean, the other way, the other thing you, you get as well is the idea that you might say, well, it, it's likely to have this sort of effect on your reducing your life expectancy. They're all quite rough. I mean, I, I think the thing that I am saying is that you need to try to, without being misleading, try to give different levels of explanation for people in different situations. Ideally, of course, it's one-to-one. -one. When you're putting things up, on a public forum. And I think it's important that there is good information up there because there's plenty of bad information. Um, then, you know, there are ways that have been established that are relatively good at trying to explain 
what a small number is. Uh, you know, like think of a town the size of Coventry with 300,000 people. What we're saying is one person in this town might have this event or, you know, something like that. There, there are ways. I'm not an expert on it, but you can do it. Mm. And yeah, just on that last point, I think that the way that the university does it, at least the University of Warwick, it reports the number of um, positive cases and then also the number of positive tests in within the university itself and when i when i first looked at it i was like huh it's like it was it was around five just mm -hmm. in the whole university and i thought you know that really puts into perspective because when you think about the whole country hundreds of thousands you think wow that's a big mm. number I've, i have to be careful of every single person i come across but then you know if you stay if you stay within the university bounds mm. the chance that you actually meet come across someone who's who has it or who can transfer it to you it's quite low Actually, that's something that has improved a bit in the media over the this year. They are tending more to report cases per 100,000 because, yes, I mean, in Cornwall, the, the number of cases tripled. Well, they'd had one and they've now got three. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's why statisticians tend to hammer on about always report the base, the reference number, um, because we don't know whether it's a big number until we've we've got a reference point. And so as, to, as a follow up to that, you mentioned the media is getting better. Um, my final question is, there are so many bad statistics related to COVID-19. Um, it's being uh, perpet perpet perpetrated. perpetrated or <laughs> it's being spread, Promulgated. propagated, that's the one. It's being propagated by, by so many different channels and so many different uh, people who have different vested interests in either getting the country uh, to slow down or speed up or uh, yeah everyone has their own opinion of, of what's of, of, of how it's going who uh, how can we fix this or how can we get the right message out and as a follow-up to that who is who is to blame uh, which is so, it's sort of, sort of a dark way of putting it but how, how can we do better perhaps as statisticians academics um, the media or the general public to understand statistics and communicate them properly? So the, the Royal Statistical Society for quite a long time now has given awards for good journalism on the grounds that instead of grumping and laughing away in a corner, they could do something more constructive and all credit to them. So yes, you want to try to ensure that your media are more educated. Um, Michael Gove in the Ditchley lecture has said that the UK civil service is well behind other countries in numeracy, as indeed are the MPs. And I think that's that's clearly quite a big issue. It's an interesting question because you've got this balance between individual responsibility and collective responsibility. Um, people can choose whether they look at multiple sources of information. You know, if I when I was head of a department, people said, can we have a newspaper? I deliberately got a different newspaper each week because if you read both the Telegraph and the Guardian, you know, the Daily Mail and the Sun, the Star, you actually get a different range and it helps you to appreciate the range of perspectives there are on things. Um, when it comes to medical things, I, you know, I do tend to have my more trusted sources like the Cochrane Collaboration and the NHS and some of the bigger charities. Um, in terms of the other side of it, it is what, again, the RSS has been trying to do for a long time, which is just to encourage more, more statistical awareness. So, you know, for me, it very much is what was the question and where did you get that data? You know, I asked three of my friends what they thought. Um, and by the way, they were all my 80 year old friends living in South Africa. So perhaps they don't know that much about what teenagers in the UK are doing. Um, the other thing we have to recognize is we all have a finite amount of time. We don't have time to check everything. We have to accept that there's a lot of rumor. There always has been. The way it's communicated is very different and the speed is different, but there is a lot of rumor. And I think it's a combination of individual integrity, deciding which elements you are going to object to. I mean, I'm tending to focus now on statistics in the law and in pensions. 
and you know as i say my colleagues are doing brilliant work on a, another of other areas um and actually frankly i think a lot of academics um outside of statistics department probably make myself quite unpopular could do with a little bit more effort on the subject of going and talking to people who really understand statistics and getting the basics right okay thank you very much for coming on our podcast it's been an absolute pleasure to have you and i'm sure we've all learned a lot about statistics uh, and how they can be communicated in a better way so thank you very much for coming on good thank you Thank you for inviting me. I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much to everyone for listening to our final episode of the year. We've been lucky enough to have a wide variety of guests from authors to professors to industry leaders to researchers on the cutting edge of data science. Links to any specific references to websites or articles can be found in the episode's notes. It's been an absolute pleasure making these episodes for you all, and I hope that you all enjoyed listening to them. Our next episode will be a review of what the Data Science Society has achieved in 2020 and what we're planning for 2021. From everyone at the team, I wish you all a very happy new year.